Hi, Professor Jared Rathel. Thank you for joining me in the second piece of Lesson 3-5. So we're going to continue to think about animal diversity, but now we're going to really hone in on mass extinction events and their importance in driving subsequent adaptive radiations. In our previous evolution unit, we spent a fair amount of time discussing microevolution. That is to say, small changes in allele frequencies across time and space. Today, we're going to be thinking about the other end of the spectrum, macroevolution. This refers to sweeping changes that we observe in the fossil record above the species level such as the colonization of land by tetrapods or the evolution of flight in the theropods. So we recognize that the fossil record is bound within the geologic record, which is systematically divided by geologists into units like eons and eras and epochs. Boundaries between these defined periods are often marked by extinction events. So, extinction is not the exception for life on Earth. Extinction is the rule. All species alive today, including us, will eventually go extinct. Estimates suggest that 99.99% of the species that have ever lived on the face of this planet are now extinct. A mass extinction event is defined as an extinction event where more than half of the marine species on the planet go extinct. Mass extinctions are caused by extraordinary and unfortunately very rare events. Events like super volcanoes or collisions by asteroids, runaway climate change. It depends on your criteria for defining a mass extinction event, but most paleontologists conventionally define five, known as the big five mass extinction events, including the end Ordovician right here. This is the time uh, that many lineages of those trilobites died off. The end Permian right here, also known as the Great Dying. This is the most widespread and devastating extinction event in the history of our planet. Some 96% of marine species are estimated to have gone extinct and 70% of terrestrial species. During this time period, there was unprecedented and massive supervolcanic activity in Siberia. This is the end Triassic period right here. This allows, this extinction event allows for the dinosaurs to take over the planet until the end Cretaceous period right here, 66 million years ago, which wipes out all of the large-bodied animals, including the dinosaurs, with the exception of the crocodilians and the sea turtles. Uh, the end Cretaceous, of course, is going to allow for the age of mammals, which is what we'll conclude with today. So some including myself, would make the argument that today we are currently in the midst of the sixth great extinction event. But this extinction event is not caused by supervolcanoes or asteroids. It's caused by a cosmopolitan African primate that is transforming the planet. In the 1970s, a scientist named Jack Sapkowski embarked on the most ambitious fossil hunt ever. But instead of digging in the dirt, he dug through dusty piles of academic research and scraped together a record of all the ocean-dwelling creatures known to science. It was tedious work, but the data it yielded gave rise to perhaps the most famous chart in paleontology, a tally of marine life over time that revealed five catastrophic global biodiversity crashes in Earth's past. 
Those crashes, known as the Big Five mass extinctions, are commonly believed to have been the biggest die-offs in Earth's history, both in and out of the oceans. They include that time 66 million years ago when a huge meteorite took out the non-avian dinosaurs, as well as the even more apocalyptic extinction at the end of the Permian period, which wiped out more than 90% of Earth's species. But the Big Five weren't the only big mass extinctions, and they might not have even been the biggest. Take the Great Oxygenation Event of 2.3 billion years ago. Evidence from ancient rocks tells us that levels of atmospheric oxygen spiked around this time, poisoning the oxygen-hating microbes that had dominated Earth for well over a billion years. And yet, we can't really say how that extinction compares to the Big Five, because its victims were microscopic and left virtually no signature in the fossil record. In fact, the fossil record only captures a tiny fraction of the life that has ever existed on our planet, but it also captures a different fraction from one period to the next. In general, the record gets less and less complete the further back in time you go, but that trend is complicated by several other factors. For one, we have a lot more fossils from swampy places and periods of the past, not necessarily because those periods were more diverse but because the calm, muddy conditions were perfect for preservation. We also have a lot more rock from some periods of time than others, and in general, the more rock we have, the more fossils we find, and the more abundant life appears to have been. In other words, the fossil record is inconsistent, so we can't just tally the number of species and take the results at face value, as Sapkowski's Big Five chart did. But paleontologists have used some clever statistics to adjust for those inconsistencies, and the latest diversity curve makes it look like there have been eight major mass extinctions, rather rather than five. But you could also count 11, or just narrow the list to the three most massive. In short, it's pretty arbitrary. What isn't arbitrary is that some mass extinctions alter the evolutionary tree of life far more radically than others. For example, the first of the Big Five pruned away more than 80% of the species on Earth, but it left all the big branches of the tree intact, so life went on more or less as it had before. Other mass extinctions, even some smaller ones, like the one 66 million years ago, trimmed the evolutionary tree far less evenly, decimating some previously thriving branches and preparing others for world domination. We can't talk about the evolutionary history of life on planet Earth and not give some props to the dinosaurs. So this incredibly diverse group of reptiles evolves approximately 230 million years ago and then really radiates following the Triassic, Jurassic, mass extinction event. The dinosaurs go on to become the dominant terrestrial vertebrates for 165 million years. So when most of us think about dinosaurs, we think about that terrible lizard king, Tyrannosaurus rex. Really cool paper came out in 2017 that provided some pretty good evidence that Tyrannosaurus did indeed have feathers uh, on its upper torso. Not flight feathers, but feathers that were used for thermoregulation. So it's really no wonder that dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus capture our imagination. Uh, the Tyrannosaurus was some 40 feet in length weighed like 18,500 pounds. Here's a beautiful artist rendition of it doing battle with a very formidable foe, the armored and club-wielding Ankylosaurus. But we have to remember, dinosaurs ruled the planet for 165 million years. Thus, they had the opportunity to evolve into every imaginable, every conceivable ecological niche. Yes, some dinosaurs were massive, but many dinosaurs were small. Some dinosaurs were carnivores, some were herbivores, some were insectivores, like you see here. Some dinosaurs were quadrupeds on four legs, bipedal. Uh, there were even these lineages of massive aquatic reptiles, fully aquatic reptiles known as the mosasaurs and plesiosaurs. The dinosaurs were likely tetrachromatic. They saw a fourth primary color in the ultraviolet side of the spectrum like modern day reptiles do today. And undoubtedly, the dinosaurs came in a striking array of colors, evolved in response to sexual selection, just like modern birds today. 
the hadrosaurs. You see a collection of them here. These are the duck-billed dinosaurs. These guys had these elaborate crests on their heads that contained these long and resonant extensions of their breathing tracts. They were tubes that could easily produce low-frequency sounds. So these were herd dinosaurs, and they probably used these head trumpets, if you will, for alarm calls. Myasaura, another hadrosaur, is known as the good mother lizard. She tended her nest. She took care of her hatchlings. So parental care is rare in the reptiles today, although we do see it in the crocodilians, one of the lineages that makes it through the end Cretaceous. And one fateful day, 66 million years ago, the world was changed forever. An asteroid estimated to be six to nine miles across in diameter, that's the size of Manhattan, and traveling at an estimated 44,700 miles per hour, collides with planet Earth. It smashes into our planet with an energy equivalent of 100 trillion tons of TNT. That's 21 billion Hiroshima atomic bombs. It generates a cloud of superheated ash and steam that's going to kill everything for thousands of miles around. It triggers perhaps the most massive earthquake in the history of the planet, and subsequent tsunamis all around the world wash the coasts. Further, Trillions of tons of material are ejected into the atmosphere, initially raising global temperatures rapidly and substantially, causing raging wildfires all around the globe. The water, the air, the soil, they're all poisoned by cyanide and heavy metals like nickel and lead from that vaporized asteroid. The sulfur that's released into the atmosphere initially uh, rains down as acid rain and then leads to a global cooling known as a nuclear winter, which maybe blocked out the sun for, for decades, greatly reducing photosynthetic output and causing reverberations throughout the food web. All of the large-bodied animals, greater than 55 pounds, with the exception of the crocodilians and the sea turtles, who managed to make it through somehow, all the other 55-pound and greater animals blink out. The impact site, known as the Chicxulub Crater, is hidden beneath the Yucatan Peninsula and the Gulf of Mexico. That buried crater is over 93 miles in diameter, and get this, it's 12 miles deep, well into the continental crust. Recall Carl Sagan's quote, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Well, in addition to finding the impact site, the Chicxulub crater, we also have extraordinary evidence as the in Cretaceous layer is marked by a thin layer of iridium from over a hundred sites all around the world. Iridium is a very rare element in planet Earth's crust, but it's abundant in meteorites. Directly above the Cretaceous fossils, there is a dark layer of sediment with unusually high concentrations of iridium, like a hundred times greater than the background, uh, um, the background amounts of iridium in sedimentary rock. Very strong evidence that this asteroid, this space rock, vaporized and then rained down on the planet. Small nocturnal shrew-like mammals 
somehow survive the end Cretaceous extinction event and then radiate into an incredible diversity of forms. This mass extinction event, the end Cretaceous, as devastating as it was for life on planet Earth, allowed for the age of mammals. It allowed for the existence of you and I. An adaptive radiation occurs when a single lineage or a small number of lineages undergoes a rapid burst of evolution and radiates into many distinct species. We talked about this in the last unit. A single colonizing rose finch gave rise to 56 different species of Hawaiian honey creepers. We see a similar adaptive radiation in the shrike-like vangids across the Malay archipelago, as well as another adaptive radiation in the cichlid fish in the Great African Lakes, where a handful of ancestral fish radiate into every conceivable ecological niche of fish again and again and again across each of these great lakes. Finally, the lemurs on the island of Madagascar radiated into at least a hundred different species, most of which have gone extinct, but the tiny mouse lemur, which fits in your palm of your hand, still exists today. There was also a giant lemur the size of a gorilla. This one's my favorite right here. This is the Ai, A-Y-E, A-Y-E. It's a nocturnal lemur with these long probing fingers for scooping out insects. So following the extinction of the dinosaurs, the mammals are now going to evolve into all of those available niches that the great reptiles once dominated. So Ankylosaurus, the armored club-wielding dinosaur that was fighting T-Rex, is now going to be replaced by the giant armadillo Glyptodon. Many of these amazing mammals persisted up until relatively recently. Here in North America, for example, we had three species of elephants. We had the giant ground sloth. We had camels. We had hippopotamuses. We had a short-faced bear. We had Smilodon, an American lion, and dire wolves. So this Pleistocene megafauna actually persists up until about 11,000 years ago. And we'll talk about the loss of the Pleistocene megafauna and the colonization of the world by humans in our final unit uh, in ecology. But I do want to leave you with this. The lineage that ends up producing Homo sapiens diverges from that of the great apes some 14 million years ago. And we actually share a recent common ancestor with chimpanzees and bonobos, the pygmy chimpanzee, as recently as 6 million years ago. How is it possible to see such rapid evolutionary change in such a short amount of time? How is it that our cranial capacity protecting our signature organ, our massive brains, how is it that that has increased so much in just six million years? It turns out that mutations in the genes that coordinate the development of our jaw muscles was critical. So please check out the amazing video that I posted in Canvas right below this lecture. It's entitled, What Darwin Never Knew, and it's an amazing piece of scientific discovery.